Well, good morning, New Hope. How's everybody doing? All right, that was a better response than the 8 a.m., which is always helpful. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because we can have a peace and we can have a joy and we can have an attitude of gratitude in all seasons. And I know that uh, this Thanksgiving may have looked very different for you. It looked different at my house. My parents, uh, I was not able to celebrate with them. So it was just my sister, my brother-in-law, and Georgine Yulstead at our house. And we had a wonderful time. Um, For some of you, this may have been the first Thanksgiving after the loss of a loved one, maybe a husband or a wife or a grandma or an aunt. And uh, I I know that this year um, has been difficult in many ways, but we can still rejoice in the circumstance, not for the circumstance, but in the circumstance. Why? Because he is the Lord and he's given us breath and he's worthy of that. So I'd encourage us, New Hope, let's continue to live in an attitude of gratitude. We are continuing in our series in Romans, Romans chapter two. I don't have a title for this message. It's just Romans chapter 2. That's what it is. It's as creative as it gets this morning. If you missed the past two Sunday mornings, then you would have missed Pastor Jeff starting this series in the first part of Romans 1, and then Pastor Luke sharing in the second part of Romans 1. It's important that you go back and uh, listen to those. There's a lot of good stuff shared. And uh, some of you are new to the New Hope family, and you might not know that on Sunday nights, our Sunday night service is 100% different than our Sunday morning. It's different worship. It's a different message. It's a different pastor sharing. It, it's completely different. We usually leave 10 to 15 minutes at the end of that time to be able to pray uh, by yourself or with your spouse or with your family. It's, it's a great opportunity for those looking for more to get more. More worship, more of the word, more of God's presence, more time with your family, doing really what the most important thing that you can do with the family, and that's being in the presence of God and praying. So we are in a sun, uh, Sunday night series titled, Don't Be a Grinch. And uh, we've had two weeks. Pastor Courtney absolutely knocked it out of the park. How many have ever heard Pastor Courtney speak? Right? She's amazing. And if you miss Pastor Courtney, she's our uh, kids pastor. Um, If you miss her message, go on YouTube and do yourself a favor and listen to last week's Don't Be a Grinch by Pastor Courtney. Pastor Zach is wrapping up that series tonight, 6 p.m. Would love to see you again tonight. But hopefully you've had enough time to turn to Romans chapter 2. We'll be focusing on the first 13 verses And let's go ahead and read that this morning. You can follow along on the screens or in your word. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, Do you think that you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. Your word that is described as a double edged sword. And I pray that this morning your spirit would quicken the word to our hearts, to our minds, that we would sit here with open 
eyes, hearts, and ears so that we might hear what you are speaking to us, God. I pray that you would flow through me, you'd continue to challenge me, and and sand me, and mold me into the the person that you want me to be, Lord. And this morning, we would all have something from you, God. So speak to us from your word. We give you our attention, and help us, Lord, be attentive this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of dissect these 13 verses. We're going to reread through them, and I'm just going to kind of give some commentary, and then we'll get practical here at the end. So let's start with Paul's words in verse 1. It says, You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge others, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, anytime we get to Scripture and we see the word therefore, we stop and see why it's therefore, right? We've talked about this a lot. So in order to understand what Paul is talking about in chapter 2, we would first have to understand what Paul was addressing in chapter 1. In chapter 1, Paul spends his time addressing the guilt and the conduct of the Gentiles. And now in chapter 2, he's shifting his focus off of the Gentiles and he's focusing it to the Jews. So when he says you, he's referring and he's talking to the Jewish audience in the church in Rome. And this is made clear in verse 17, which we didn't read. And when Paul says, you who pass judgment do the same things, well, what are those same things that we're talking about? If we didn't have context, if we didn't stop to see what the therefore was there for, we wouldn't know what these things Paul is talking about, which he's referring to chapter 1. So we're going to read that real quick. Romans 1, 29 through 32. These are the same things that the Gentiles and Jews are doing alike says this, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they don't only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. I think it's very easy for us as Christians today to look at that list of all of these things that, that the Gentiles were doing and think, oh, that's, that's just for the sinner. But you look at a word like greed and you evaluate your heart. Could that be you? How much money this year have you given to advance the kingdom of God versus spent for things that will be left here on earth when we die? We look at things such as boastful or disobeying parents or envy or deceit or gossips. And I think it's very easy to kind of dismiss this list of things as something that is not pertinent to our hearts. But if Paul is rebuking the Jews and saying, Jews, you are no better than the Gentiles in this aspect. You are behaving in the same way that they are behaving. If Paul were to write a letter to New Hope today, would he be addressing you in the same way that he's addressing the Jews? Would he be calling us out in our hypocrisy? It's easy to brush that statement off and say, I'm not, I'm not a hypocrite. But I think when we really allow the Spirit of God to speak to us, I believe there are things that the Lord might be speaking to individual hearts this morning that we need to address. And we can only address those things by the Spirit that lives inside of us and reveals them. See, my prayer is that you would never be the reason why someone doesn't come and grace New Hope's doors. When you go out and you act and you speak and you serve and you love and you give, you are representing more than just your last name. If you consider yourself a Christian, you are first and foremost an ambassador, meaning a representative of Jesus Christ himself. And the things that you do and the places you go and the words that you speak, they represent Christ first. If you consider yourself a member of New Hope Assembly of God, you are representing New Hope. This church has a great reputation in this community. It does. Why is it? Because of the great preaching? Well, obviously. No, I'm just teasing, right? Is it because of the awesome worship? Is it because of of the, the beautiful of the Christmas decorations? No, it's because of the people. It's because of you. It's because you guys represent this church well. And I applaud you, but I challenge you to allow God's spirit to further refine. 
See, salvation, this isn't in my notes, but salvation is more than, than just being saved from the penalty of our sin. That's, that's a process of justification, being made just as if I'd never sinned, being saved from the penalty of our sin. And, and, and we like to look forward to the third part of salvation, which is glorification, which is where we're saved from the very presence of sin, where we are taken up to heaven, and we are in the presence of Jesus, and there is no more sin. But Christians, we, in church, we cannot neglect the middle part of salvation, which is sanctification, where God saves us from the very power of sin. You guys have the power of the Spirit of God living inside you so that you are no longer a slave to sin, but you can live righteous in the way that God has set you to do. We need God's Spirit so that we might live a life that glorifies and brings glory to God. Let's not just be Christians by name. Let's be a Christian by the fruit in our life produced by the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts. Paul continues in verse two. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Church, hear me loud and clear. Everyone here, every per- person that has or had breath in their lungs will face the judgment day. They will face Jesus and Jesus will judge you. See, I think we live in a culture where we like to fly under the radar. I think it's demonstrated where you just walk in an empty hallway and it's like, don't make eye contact with the one other person in the empty hallway. You know, pull out your phone and fake a text, fake a phone call. You know, we we can't have conversation. We like to fly under the radar. How many ever flown on an airplane before? Right? Okay, quite a few of you. I've done a decent amount of traveling, and it is my goal to fly under the radar during the TSA security check. Not for any good reason. I'm not hiding anything, right? But I just don't want TSA getting all up in my business and and just, you know... I'm not about that. I just want to just get there, keep my head down, don't look suspicious, kind of keep an eye on my bags, and just get in and out of there as quick as possible. I remember this one time going on a mission trip, and we had to take about $40,000 worth of cash to this country because the banks in this country were corrupt, and they had gang members uh, that would have family members at the banks, and they would tip people off if the missionaries or someone would go and withdraw large amounts of money. It put a big target on their back. So we were bringing in money to pay for the the daily expenditures such as the hotels, the food, the different things. And it was a construction project and it was about $20,000 worth of work that we were doing. So we bring in about $40,000 worth of cash and we divide it uh, among a handful of the people um, uh, in our, our group and we had anywhere from two to $7,000 cash. And when you go through customs, you cannot take more than $10,000 cash uh, as you enter into a, a new country. And so here I am walking with $7,000 in my pocket through our treasurers looking at me like, you did what? <laughs> um, uh, in, in my pocket, and I'm thinking, keep your head down, don't get caught. I'm like looking at all these bags. I'm looking at all the bags that are getting searched. I'm like, I don't want to have to answer any questions. No, we're not smuggling drug money in here. Like, I, I just fly under the radar, and I don't want to be interrogated and, and searched by the TSA. But let me tell you this, church, there is no avoiding the judgment day. There will come a tell all day where God will search and examine every part of your life, and He will begin to Dive deep, dive dive deep into your life, and, and and he'll see every moment, every word that you spoke, every action that you had. It, it's it's going to be a day that is coming. There's no avoiding and there's no eluding it. We will not escape God's judgment. Are you ready? Are you ready? I stand ready. Why? Because I have the blessed hope of Jesus Christ, who has paid the penalty for my sin. But I also want us this morning to really consider to stand ready where God can look at our life and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. When you called, or when I called, you answered. When, when, when I asked you to give, you gave freely, even when you didn't, it didn't make sense. You, you overachieved. Here's a seat of honor. I, I, I want all of us to be able to look forward to that day of judgment because there's no flying under the radar. Verse 4, he continues, Or do you show content for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, 
you are storing up wrath for yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. It's God's kindness. It's his forbearance. It's his patience that leads us to repentance. Now, the word kindness in the Greek is a little bit of a tricky word to translate. The basic thought is that of goodness. It's God's goodness expressed in kindness. In fact, this same word here translated as kindness is translated in in chapter 3, verse 12, as good. It's the goodness of God. It's the forbearance. It's the patience. It's the kindness. And and it's that long-suffering. Why why is he kind? Why is he good? In hopes that the sinner will repent and turn from their sin. Have you ever wondered why horrible people seem to get away with doing horrible things? Anybody ever wondered that? Like, why, why why would they get away with that? Many have wrongfully viewed God's forbearance and patience as forgiveness. Forgiveness is is not forbearance and patience. It's just a delay. This, This couldn't be farther from the truth. Just because you are not facing a consequence now doesn't mean that you're off the hook. Steve, can you throw that slide up? Thank you. The word forbearance translated as tolerance in other versions has the Greek meaning of stopping, especially in the sense of hostility. So forbearance is more of a truce than it is peace. It doesn't mean peace. It means truce. There's a limit. It's temporary. It's God withholding his judgment for a period of time. Why? In hopes that the sinner would turn from his ways and accept the gift of salvation and change his heart. The horrible person who appears to get away with it will face judgment. Can I urge us, church, to live a life of repentance? It is their unrepentant heart that stores up wrath. Are you sorry for the sins that you committed this week? Has that even crossed your mind? Have you even allowed the Spirit of God to speak to you and to challenge you and to refine your way of thinking, your actions? Let's live a church, let's live as a church that responds to the goodness, the kindness of God and let's repent and turn of our ways. Moving on, the next six verses relate to each other, starting in verse six. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be anger and wrath. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. Now Paul is using something commonly known in Greek literature called a chiastic structure. Turn to your neighbor and say, chiastic structure. How many have ever heard of a chiastic structure? It's simply this, where you, you, you repeat words or thoughts, and, and then uh, you list them, and then you repeat them in reverse order. And, and, and so Paul is trying to use a contemporary way, way of literacy that the Greeks would understand to drive home a, a point. As you can see in this slide, verses 6 and 11 relate to each other, where it essentially says the same thing, that God will judge fairly. Then in verses 7 and 10, they have the same concept, where God will reward those who do good with glory and eternal life. And then 8 and 9, in the middle, talk about God giving wrath to those who do evil. So what is the idea? What is the concept? What is it that Paul is so desperately trying to get his audience to understand? It's this new hope, that God will repay you for what you do. God will repay you for what you do. A huge misconception of heaven is that everything will be equal. That's that's not the case. Heaven is not a socialistic place. It's not just this everybody gets the same share amount. When you get to heaven, there is more than just living eternally in heaven. There are riches and there are glories in heaven. There will be a reward system. And laced throughout scripture, we see this idea of being rewarded for what we do. We see it in Isaiah. We see it in Psalms. We see it in in the Gospels. We see it in 1 Corinthians 3. We see it here in 2 verse 6. God will repay us for what we do. And I find it interesting that in other texts in the New Testament, 
that it talks about storing up riches, glory, and treasures, but here it talks about storing up anger and wrath. It's a little scary, right? It's a, that's a little unsettling. See, actions represent and demonstrate your beliefs, your attitudes, inner spiritual condition, and that's why we'll be judged by our actions and conduct. Because it's just the fruit of your life. You can say all day to your, your wife, honey, I love you, I love you, I love you, but if you leave the toilet seat lit up, what does that communicate? <laughs> Easy on the ribs, ladies, okay? <laughs> James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in his book, that you have faith, great, I'll show you my faith. You wanna see what faith looks like? Look at my life. I'll show you by what I do. That's what I believe. The, the proof is in the obedience. The proof is, is in the demonstration. And it's not of my own works. This is by the work of the Holy Spirit that changes your heart. See, we don't want to be a church that produces fake fruit. How many have ever, or maybe right now at your house, you've got like fake fruit as a decoration. You know, it's like Christmas. Maybe that was only my mom growing up, but there'd be like fake grapes. And as a kid, I'd be like, ah. Oh, that's rubber, you know, and, and fake apples and stuff. Like, you know what fake fruit is in the Christian world? It's when you're doing it in your own works and you're doing it out of obligation. It, it's, it's when you're giving uh, b because um, you, you feel like you need to earn um, something from God or you're, you're doing it just to appease God and, and turn his wrath away from you. It's, it's serving just so that you can look good. No, real fruit... The kind that is desirable and draws people in is the fruit that flows from the Spirit. It's when we put our flesh to death and we say, I don't want to do what I want to do, but God, I need, I need your Spirit to fill me and enable me so that it's no longer me just doing these things out of ritual because I know I should. It's doing these things because I want to do that. Some, some of the things that should come naturally to you when you're a born again believer in Christ is giving, forgiving, kindness, mercy, compassion, patience. Ooh, I wonder if you guys are patient. You know where I struggle with patience the most? Driving on the interstate when there's a dingus in the left hand lane that is going 64 and you're supposed to be going 77. That, that just requires all of my patience. And I'm sorry for calling you a dingus. I don't even know what that is. I hope that's not really bad. I'll probably get a deduction on that or something. Back to my notes. Patience. Humility. Preferring others in love. I think the list goes on of these things that, that should come naturally to you. And none of this will save you, right? Being patient, being merciful, being gracious, being kind, being forgiving and giving, none of that will save you because only Jesus can save you, but it will mark you as a true follower. Ask yourself this morning, if you were to die today, what would your reward look like in heaven? Let, let's focus that question in just a little bit more. If you were to die today and just be rewarded on what 2020 has brought, what would your reward look like in heaven? Continuing on, we'll wrap this up in 12 and 13. Paul says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. These two final verses are more of the same. We are saved by grace through faith, but faith is never alone. And hear me, New Hope, we must learn to live in the tension of both mercy and works. We, we must learn to live in the tension of grace and works. How many feel that? Like, oh, am I trying to earn my way of salvation? Or, or have I done enough? Or am I relying too much and I'm, I'm just sinning so that grace might abound, right? There's this middle ground where you feel the pull of both. And we must learn to live in that. And as we work, as we perform the works that Christ has set in advance for us to do, it will give us a confidence on the day of judgment. That's what I long for you guys to have. 
We don't have to be afraid of the day of judgment. You don't have to be afraid that God is going to reveal all your works, but by his spirit, he will enable you to bring glory to him and to live a life in such a way that you will receive a reward someday in heaven. See, today's sermon is, isn't to scare you into doing good works. This isn't meant to guilt you into becoming more active in your faith, but I pray that it helps you realize the importance and bring some motivation in your Christian walk. I want you to be able to look forward to the day, standing confidently before Christ because of the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, but also standing confidently because you're confident that you're going to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. See, I don't, I don't want to just get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I want, I want a seat of honor. I, I want the presidential suite. I, I, I want to be rewarded. I want God to, to take me and say, this was Austin Weaver. Look at what he's done. And, and, and here's the thing, New Hope. I don't want this to turn into we're doing good works for something, Right? I don't want it to just be all about rewards because it's not all about rewards. Rewards is the cherry on top. But you know what the greatest reward I believe in heaven will be? Is when you stand up there someday and you look to the left and the right and you see I influenced that person into the kingdom of God. And I remember praying with this person in my office at work and them receiving salvation. And, and, and the only thing that you can bring to heaven is people. Everything else will be left here. Your riches, your accomplishments, your reputation, everything, it will all be left here, but you can bring people. You can bring your estranged brother or sister. You can bring your crazy aunt who needs the Lord. You can bring that coworker that is a thorn in your side. You can bring people to heaven. And, and, and the only way that we can get our hearts to align with God's heart is when we ask him in the morning, just simply say, God, would you fill my spirit with your spirit so that I might desire the things that you want? Because in my flesh, I don't want the things that, that God wants. In my flesh, I think about hunting. In my flesh, I think about this. I think about that. I think about all these different things. And it's not until I die to my flesh and say, God, fill me with your spirit that his will would align with my will. Or I should say, my will begins to align with his will because he begins to change our hearts and transform it. Two things that I want to highlight in how we can live a, a life that brings glory to God and, and a life that is worthy of reward. And the first is realizing that community is crucial. Okay? Community is crucial. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not forsake gathering to, together as the day draws near, but let us gather to encourage each other. Right? Why do we gather at church? To encourage. Why, why do we, we gather in small groups to encourage? Just by a show of hands, how many have ever been encouraged by gathering together with fellow believers and Christians, right? How many have ever encouraged someone when you gather together, right? But we can't forget uh, verse 26 in this where it says, those who willfully keep on sinning, no sacrifice will be left for their sins, only judgment. I should say this, those who willfully keep on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth. We gather together, we have community, we have Sunday school once that gets fired up. We've got small groups, we've got Celebrate Recovery, we've got all of these different opportunities for community because it encourages us. And there's days where I'm dragging, but someone is gonna say, hey, come on, step with it. Let's keep the pace, let's, let's keep on fighting. We're, we're going to the end, Austin, let's go, get up, move. And we can encourage each other. I think church would be so much more satisfying if we stopped coming here wanting to receive and looking for opportunities to give. What if, what if we, during worship it wasn't about receiving God's blessing and it's all about this, but it's God, you're good, you are awesome, you're the number one, you're the man, air knuckles, you know, like, what if, what if we, I honestly believe this with my whole heart, the most powerful times of worship are when we glorify God because he inhabits the praises of his people. He doesn't inhabit the, I surrender, I want to know you more. Now, is there anything wrong with singing that? No. Is there anything wrong with asking for that? No. I don't even know where I'm at in my notes. I need to get back. We need to encourage each other. 
And small groups, coming to church and Christian community is key. Get creative. This year has been a creative year. Get creative in community. You can't do it being the Lone Ranger. And the second thing is let a righteous man strike me. You say, what in the world does that mean? Psalm 141 verse 5 says, let a righteous man strike me. That is kindness. Let him rebuke me. That is oil on my head. Many of you are familiar with Proverbs 27, 17, where it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, or one friend sharpens another. See, the problem is that some of us are like the Jews, where we're willing to cast judgment and we're willing to sharpen and speak into people's life, but as soon as someone tries to speak into your life, you run. You don't like the uncomfortable conversation. We need accountability. We need someone that is pushing us and sharpening us so that we can achieve all that God has asked us to do. You can't do it apart from community, but even more focused than just having a community of group is an individual, a person, one or two people that will speak truth into your life. See, the level I trust someone is the level of uh, is, is the level that they will speak truthfully to me. There's, there's only a handful of people, probably five people, that I feel like I can give my 100% trust to. Because I, I, I welcome rebuke. My friend Jared, there's a picture of him on the screen. I've known him, or actually he's known me, every day of my life. He's a couple years older than me. The upper left picture is a picture of my sister holding his sister, um, Kimberly, and Jared's holding his baby sister, Kristen, there. I'm on my knees, looking cute as ever. <laughs> a couple nerdy pictures of Jared with his big glasses, shark shirt, and him and his beautiful wife from this past September on an anniversary getaway. And I look at Jared, and it's hard not to get emotional because I could take you different times, oftentimes in different vehicles, first my Jeep, then my Impala, now my truck, where Jared has spoken into my life. And he's sharpened me. And I've got blind spots in my conduct. And if it weren't for his rebuke, a righteous man striking me, if it weren't for his kindness, I wouldn't be who I am today. Some of you need to be more like Jared. And some of you, hear me, need to stop pushing Jared's out of your life. There's people that have spoken into your life and you view it as judgmental and mean and you push them out of your life. Could it be the kindness of God extended through man's mouth? Could it be the goodness of God trying to move you into a place of sanctification, trying to make you become more holy so that more might know his name, that more might enter the kingdom of God? We can't do this on our own. This is too great of a task. And first and foremost, I hope that you've gathered this, we need the Holy Spirit of God in us and through us to make this possible. Because achieving holiness on our own just ain't going to work. It's not going to happen. It's not the way it was intended. But even more than that, community is crucial and we need righteous people in our lives speaking to our blind spots. Would you stand with me this morning all across this room and close your eyes? We're going to sing a song about the goodness of God. And some of you here might feel like, well, I've done so much just garbage in my life and I have screwed up so many times and I don't even, I don't even know if God would forgive me. I don't even know if he would love me. I don't even know that, that he's even paying attention with what's going on with my mess right now. Can I tell you that his goodness, 
His kindness, his patience, his forbearance is there for you to take advantage of. He's inviting you to repent, to turn from your ways and say, God, I trust in your way. I need you in my life. I need you to forgive me. He doesn't want to, to, to punish you. That's why he's patient. That's why there's a truce. That's why time is ticking out because there will be a judgment day. He's wanting you to step and respond to the goodness of God. The only appropriate response is to offer our life in total surrender. Where we lay our life down. Where we bow our knee and confess you as Lord. You as King. With every eye closed in this place out of respect from your neighbor. If there's anyone here that you'd say, Jesus, save me, forgive me, change me, enter my life. I need you. I turn from my sin. You are the only way. And, and I'm asking you to be Lord and Savior. I need a Savior this morning. For the first time, you say, Jesus, come into my heart and change me. Would you just raise your hand and look at me? Is there anyone here? Yes. Would you just pray this prayer and make this your own prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I pray that you would change my way of thinking that you would heal my mind, forgive me of my past mistakes, and set my feet on a new path, in a new direction, a direction that would bring glory to you, and a direction that would be filled with forgiveness, and love, and mercy, and compassion. Change my heart. Let me think the way that you think, and see the things that you see, Lord. Enter my life. I accept you as Lord, and I put my trust in you. I realize today that I cannot earn my way to salvation. I cannot earn my way to heaven, but I trust in what you've done. And so empower me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. And is there anyone here that would say in your heart, my life could use some improvement? Not for, for my glory, but for the glory of God. I need some heart surgery. I, I, I need to welcome some community into my life. I need to embrace some righteous men and women into my life to speak to me. I, I, I need some work. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to live in regret. I'm not going to live in shame. I'm not going to live in guilt. But I move forward by the power of God's grace to do great things for him. If that's you this morning, you say, I'm, I need more of God. And, and I'm going to move forward in community. Just raise your hand. Yes, yes. God, I just pray for the hands here that you would empower them, that your spirit would begin to fill their hearts, that there would not be a sense of regret and shame and guilt, but only that filled of love. And it's your kindness that draws us in. It's your gentleness that draws us in. And so right now, by your spirit and by your power, I pray that you'd begin to speak to people's hearts of what community circles they need to invest in need to speak to people's hearts of what friends they need to embrace and how they need to be a friend, God. Let your church be a beautiful church. Let people be drawn to your spirit because of the beauty of your people, the power of you living in us and through us. Help us, Holy Spirit, empower your people this day. Amen. Amen. God is good. God is good. Hear me this. Hear me this. Hear me this this morning. Hear this. The only level of friendship that you will have and the depth of the friendship that you will have is only what you're willing to invest in. Some people like to complain about the depths of their friendships and I would challenge you, how much are you really trying to invest? Because most people don't know how to be a friend. You've got to teach them how to be a friend. And if you want that friendship bad, bad enough, then you go and you be that friend. May God's face shine upon you. 
May his riches follow you all of your days. And God bless you on the Sunday. Come back for Pastor Zach's message. Don't be a Grinch tonight. We'll see you next week.